Welcome to the Board Game Marketing Podcast. Let's cue the intro. This is the number one podcast to learn marketing strategies for your board game. Whether you're just starting on your first game or an experienced designer, you've come to the right place. My name is Nalin, and let's talk marketing for your game. everyone. Welcome to the Board Game Marketing Podcast. Today we have the incredible Jay Cormier from Off the Page Games on the show. And, you know, I've been following a lot of Jay's videos on YouTube, so I'm personally super excited to be talking to him today. So Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's fun. It's exciting. <laughs> yeah. So firstly, I would love it if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and also about, you know, the game. Yeah, sure. So I'm Jay Cormier. I've designed oh yeah, a dozen or so, over a dozen games uh, on the market, like Belford and, and Junkart and In the Hall of the Mountain King and more. And then recently I became a publisher, first of books, because I created a the Fail Faster Playtesting Journal, uh, which guides game designers to take better notes while they're playtesting. And then more recently with the game Mind Management, um, which we got the rights back because the publisher who signed it went under. And so um, myself and Sen Fung Lim, who's the co-designer, and Matt Kint, of, uh, who's the artist and illustrator and a graphic designer, and who wrote the comics that this game is based on, had a meeting. And it was Matt who actually said, well, why don't we just do it ourselves? Uh, I, I'll do all the art and graphic design. You guys publish it. And then discussing with Sen, Sen's got a full-time job. So I said, why don't I become the publisher? And so I did all the worky work stuff uh, publishing it. And then Bob's your uncle. <laughs> I love it. I love how, you know, it all just kind of came together even after, you know, the, you know, I just had to go back and like get the rights of the game back and everything, but everything all worked out. It, yes, it did. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. So I would kind of love to hear, you know, you guys were really successful. You, you, you raised uh, like 190,000 for this game with like 2000 something backers. I would love to hear like what marketing did you do to prepare for this particular campaign and during the pre-launch stage? Yeah, not much. We just cross our fingers and hope people show up. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. Um, everything marketing starts. Marketing is everything, pretty much. Like um, when you talk, especially when you're talking about board games. And so, literally started um, early. And so, as soon as we said, "Yeah, let's do it," that was about April of last year. And so I thought, well, let's give ourselves about 11 months and we'll, we'll put the Kickstarter in next March. So literally it was 11 months, even though, and this is the game is a hundred percent done. There's no more developing of the game that has to be done. It's like, so it's like, that's just launch. We could have almost launched the next week if we wanted to, but obviously that is a poor planning from a marketing perspective. So, I mean, we could go through all sorts of things. Like we went to conventions and uh, had booths at conventions like Shucks and Fan Expo and Gen Con. We didn't have a booth, but we had a, a demos happening. I even, um, I'll say hired, but basically they volunteered. I didn't pay them anything. Uh, ambassadors to go to conventions that we couldn't go to. And they, uh, I would mail them a prototype so that they could then demo the game at uh, other conventions just to get the word out and increase that mailing list. Um, and so that's like a lot of the, the pre-work I don't know how much more detail I can go into any kind of facet of, of details if you want, or just keep rambling about all the different things I did. Oh, uh, I would love uh, both, you know, let's, let's start <laughs> off with all the different things you did. And if you, anything you particularly enjoy doing, let's, let's talk some more about that. Well, I mean, I enjoyed all of it because it was all new to me because I haven't, uh, even though with Fail Faster, um, uh, which was guide, uh, geared towards game designers, that was a totally different type of marketing because it was just to game designers. So now this is marketing that is towards everybody so that likes games in a way. Uh, now it's, it is based on a comic book, but I was trying to market it such that it, it was a board game on its own and then it kind of stood on its two, own two feet. I was a little concerned that people... Uh, would think, oh, I don't know that comic book, therefore uh, this game isn't for me, which I personally have said that about some games when I look at it. I'm like, oh, I, yeah, that is a com I've never read that comic. I guess I, I won't look at that game. So I wanted to make sure this game stood on its own. So I, I kind of put that in the background of any kind of marketing I had, uh, and, and with, with which Matt Kent, the uh, creator of the comic, was totally cool with on board with because he understood that concept as well. We didn't want the Venn diagram of just the mind management comic fans who are board game fans to buy this game. So that was, that was key. Um, let's see. So um, as we were getting closer, then 
uh, I would do a bunch of contests. I, I signed up to Gleam and they help manage um, the contest kind of portion. Not, this is to help increase the mailing list. And I'm not 100% sure if that was uh, worth it. A lot of people say you got to increase your mailing list and I don't disagree. Um, be, but I think um, looking at the results, it doesn't feel like a lot of the the backers of my mailing list were um, part of the back the backing backers of this game. Um, although following the tracking from Facebook afterwards, it's always hard to pinpoint exactly where they originated from. It only talk, talks about where they came from on their most recent click and how they got there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, so you mentioned you were, you know, and con- so many conventions, you mentioned that you were you know, doing these giveaways with a, a platform called Gleam. And I know that you are also have a, a YouTube channel where you kind of talk through a lot of the, the game. Too. Yeah. Would love to kind of dive in it with, with that. So uh, a long time ago when Sen and I were first getting published before our first game came out, which was Belfort, um, I wanted to do more writing at the time because I was at the time was interested in, in just in writing, I guess. And, uh, I said, well, I'll write a blog. I'm like, what am I going to write a blog about? And, and I'm like, well, I guess games and I know games. And like, then he just kind of said, well, why don't, why don't I write about the process of, uh, how we got published. And so I would write these blog articles and Sen would then also tag on his thoughts to my articles. And so it was kind of like, uh, both of our thoughts of every step we took to get, uh, published. And so that's currently available on bamboozlebrothers.com. And you can click on the steps and you can see the, I think, 33 steps we took to get our game published. Um, and I've heard many people have referred back to that as a uh, resource that has helped them get published. It feels, some of it feels a little bit dated now, but it's still fairly uh, um, accurate as far as the, the steps we took. Well, it's accurate as far as the steps we took. Um, so anyways, that kind of um, altruistic aspect of giving back to the industry and like, you know, you don't have to pay for anything to get. It's just a blog and people go there and get these, you know, steps. And this was at a time where there were no, uh, this is like 2010, 2011. There's nothing out there. There was no resource out there for how to get published. We had no idea how to do this. And not that we were pioneers, but we just, we just didn't know anything. So this is why we started writing this. And now there's tons of resources out there on how to get published and whatnot. But uh, this feeling of giving back was really interesting and um, it helped give us a nice name and brand in the industry as uh, kind of two designers that, you know, whatever we make good games or whatever that kind of uh, uh, f- feedback we get, but at least we were known as being very uh, giving in the industry. And Sen has continued that with his, uh, his own podcast called the uh, Meeple Syrup Show uh, that is going weekly for many, many years and where he interviews designers and publishers and all sorts of stuff, gets the behind the scenes stuff. And so it made me think about what could I do when I was launching this game? And I thought, well, maybe I could do videos. And uh, it was, I I fortunately thought of this right at the beginning because uh, I was able to then chart the content, the whole idea, the whole process of how do you start a board game company? And that's, that's the name of the series, how to start a board game company. And so I literally would uh, have a weekly episode in which I, Uh, detailed what I was working on that week. And sometimes it would have people I would interview like a financial person or a marketing expert um, or the game trays guys, all these different people. And I didn't prep it in advance. I was literally learning uh, at the same time as anybody that would be watching. So it, it was, it was great for me from a perspective of it really helped me keep me on track because I always had to ha- make sure I had something worthwhile every week to make a video about. And so I would be like, well, what am I going to do in this coming week? I'm, I guess I got to work on this. And so I'd have to work on that in order to make sure a video was uh, ready for that week. So it was great in that perspective. And I've already heard a lot of people that have uh, watched, you know, episodes here and there and said it's helped them already. So it's, that's nice feeling. I, I'm not hundred percent sure if it was a great marketing tool Uh, Anybody that's starting a board game company, it's great for them. And yeah, maybe they've also heard of my management because that's obviously I talk a lot about that during the the episodes because that's what I'm focused on. Um, I'm not really sure if it's an amazing marketing tool or not um, because it's so specific and niche uh, for just those people. Uh, it is a marketing tool, but uh, and again, I think it helps give me the brand that, hey, here's Jay again, helping the industry and people out. So I think I like that perspective of it. As far as how much it helped mind management, I'm not too sure. At least I think the people in the industry were more apt to check it out, maybe. Um, yeah. Got it. Yeah, I, I really liked how 
you were able to offer so much insight because you were kind of in the process to getting this off the ground as you were kind of recording this video. So it was kind of like learn again, like you were saying, learning real time as you were going. Yeah, that's exactly true. Yep. Yeah. So with this said, how do you think that, you know, everything you did, you know, the, the, the giveaways, the um, conventions, all these YouTube videos and, and some other of, the, of the, these tactics that you were using during the pre-launch. Can you tell me more about like, what were your goals for pre-launch when it came to marketing? Um, it felt like my goals were about either increasing my mailing list size, because then I'll have them quote unquote forever, um, or increasing the number of people who click the remind me button on the Kickstarter uh, with a sub goal of increasing Facebook or Twitter followers. And so with Gleam, the benefit there is that you can give points for, uh, uh, you know, points are like ballots for a prize for each little task. So if join my Facebook group, you get a ballot, um, you know, follow me on Twitter, you get a ballot, uh, subscribe to my email and you get 10 ballots to make, you know, weight it. So they understand like that, they got to do that. That's super valuable. Yeah. Let's talk some more about the, the giveaways that you ran actually on Gleam since you, since you brought that up, like mm-hmm. can you tell us more about like the, the structure of it, what kind of rewards you, you gave people, how long the duration was or where you promoted it. Somewhere. Yeah. I think the, the thing about contests is that there's a challenge here because sometimes you only get people that just want to win stuff and they're not really interested in anything else. But the, I mean, the flip side is they want to win board games and they like board games. So then it's up to you then to have a good board game in the future to market towards them now that you have captured their attention. So the thought we had is some people do um, contests for, for board games of the, you know the hottest game out there like hey we're giving away a copy of gloomhaven or whatever and i just didn't feel that was on brand to what we were trying to do and so for us um i did a bunch so we did three weeks in a row we did a different contest and each one had in the contest had four different published games that were designed by sen and i and i felt that was at least like hey listen sen and i have a new game coming out hey you want to check out some of sen and jay's old games check this out and you can win one of them to play for, for yourself. And so each week I had a, uh, four new ones every week um, as a contest. Then after that, we gave away, uh, Matt Kent donated three omnibus volumes of uh, the Mind Management comic books. And that, that got a huge response. And then the fall, final week was, hey, you're going to win a actual deluxe copy of Mind Management uh, once, it, assuming it finally it gets published and uh, on succeeds on Kickstarter. And then I would advertise those uh, through my own social media channels, but then I would go pretty much as uh, wherever I could on Facebook groups was a big, uh, probably a big part of my success. And I think part of the benefit of doing contests is that, it, especially when you're talking, make sure the, my management, uh, your game is kind of in there. I think the final one is the best one because when I actually gave away the game, it's it's getting people to, uh, even if they don't click on it and they're scrolling past it, they see the mind management, they see the box, they see the image. Because the, one of the biggest goals you want, you don't want your game to launch in Kickstarter and people say, what the heck is this? Where did this come from? I've never even heard of this. And so that is a big danger you could be in. You, you, want, it, you want people to go, oh yeah, yeah, I heard about this or I saw something about this or whatever by the time your game comes out so that it's not out of left field. Um, and then I think the, that's for the gleam side of it. Um, and I, I got some success in the sense that I got, you know, definitely increased my, uh, emails, subscriber list and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I think the, one of the biggest things you can do and everyone does it, but the biggest marketing tools you can do is, uh, in the board game world is getting your game out to, um, notable reviewers. And this is getting more and more costly and, and I'm hundred percent not saying it shouldn't because they're adding an amazing value to your campaign. Um, but there is, it goes a long, long way. If you get some awesome quotes from, uh, some notable reviewers. And I was fortunate that we had a game that was good and, and the reviewers liked it. And I, I chose the, the ones that I thought were the highest brand awareness, like the Rattos and the man versus meeple and board game spotlight, like the, the biggest ones. And of course you got to pay for that. That, that costs uh, a lot of money. Uh, again, hundred percent worth it. Because fortunately, Ratto, uh, which uh, you know how exuberant he gets about some of his games reviews, um, 
yeah. <laughs> but you can tell when it's when he has some sincerity to it. Like even though he's hyperbolic about almost all his games he's played, the sometimes if he says something like what he said for us, that's pure gold in the sense that he said, uh, "My management is my favorite hidden movement game of all time," and that uh, that was not then that jumped all the way to my lead quote, and that went right to the top of my page under the 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 first image. Uh, on Kickstarter, uh, then that was the, that Rado's quote right there. Boom. And I use that in a lot of marketing and I still am using it in marketing um, because it's such an, it's a great, nice, concise quote. It's not very wordy and it's huge as far as people that know Rado. And I did a survey afterwards about asking people why they ended up backing it. What, or not why they backed it, what, what got them to my page? How did they hear about it? And uh, yeah, a lot of people said Rado and his review. So the th- Putting getting those quotes is part is great for marketing because that goes on your page. You can use those quotes. That's all amazing. But also, all these uh, people ha- um, and reviewers have channels that they put their media out to, and so everybody then the more you have out there, um, the the more that that people are just going to even hear about and see your game. Um, so that's a big factor. And then the final, unless you have a question. Oh, uh, I was just going to ask. Like, I would love to kind of dive into this review process too. Yeah. Um, after we, after your- okay. The last, the last part is that um, uh, press releases. So I, I made a press release and I, I was scouring the, wherever I could send this to um, like uh, I, I, because it's based on a comic book. I was trying to get a lot of comic book sites to, to uh, talk about this game. And I got a couple of hits, but I didn't, I wasn't super successful in um, getting that out as much as possible. And then I had, a friend of Matt who has, who works in PR, he helped out on the last, at the last minute and came in and, and just started doing his magic. And I don't know how he did his magic because he just has contacts. And this, this article started appearing everywhere and I was blown away. And that was a huge help because he, he got an article about this in the Hollywood reporter. Wow. That's I know. Cool. Yeah, That's super cool. And so it was, and it was on CBR, the number one comic book site uh, in the world. Um, so like a lot of, so getting it as a news article, which is really hard for a normal board game because who cares? And you know, who in one way, who cares? It's like, hey, here's a board game. It's go back it. That's not really news. I had the advantage of this being based on a Matt Kint comic, and uh, that that I guess leans leans itself a little bit more towards being news ish. Um, and then, you know, put some quotes in there from everybody to make it sound like it's a, a, you know, half interview, half news thing. And then the final cool coup that we had was in the middle of the campaign, we were able to get a full page ad in a comic book for this, um, this Kickstarter. Because it, and it was in Matt Kint's newest uh, comic book that he was writing. And it was for Dark Horse. And Dark Horse is the... Uh, publisher that made mind management comics and for free we got a full page comic book uh sorry ad in, in this comic book and it's and it's a very successful comic book it was only issue two but it was it jumped out of the gate and it's already a netflix deal for to make it a, a, a show so uh it was huge to get that in a comic book too yeah wow that, that's a, a lot of hard-hitting things the reviews the the PR that came out, you know, in all these channels and also the the full page ad <laughs> it all really really came together yeah, you're really wild, yeah. So for, for each of these things, um, did you kind of work to prepare this in the pre-launch stage or was it during the campaign where you kind of like uh, prepared and also rolled this out? As much as I could do beforehand because, you know, you're pretty busy during the campaign. Um, so yeah, I was trying to do as much as possible and lock it down. Even things like, while you have all your big hitter reviews come out the launch day of your campaign or even a day early, it's fine to try to get the buzz going a day or two early. It's fine. Um, then for the, the lesser known reviewers, I would actually stagger them um, throughout the campaign so that even in week two, uh, I could have something in an update to go, Hey, i got a new review. Check this out and, and tell my backers about it and get them excited. And, uh, another reason to post on social media, about like, Oh, look at this guys. There's a new review. Check this out. Um, so anything that's all planned out, um, beforehand. So there's not much planning during the campaign. It's more reactionary. So, uh, of trying to utilize any kind of new piece of information in a, in a way that uh, makes sense. Got it. And, and for people who are, are kind of newer to, to market their own board games, how, how much time would, would they kind of bank for, for get finding reviewers, 
um, sending things out, waiting for reviewers to be done, things like that. Uh, you have to do a crazy uh, work back schedule. So like, so I wanted to launch on March uh, thir- 2nd, 3rd, March 2nd, March 3rd. I can't remember beginning of March. And so I'm like, okay, so I want to launch that. So if you start looking at reviewers um, minimum, they say they need two months, the, the product two months before your Kickstarter, some say three months. So I'm like, okay, let's say three months. So that's already, they need it by January. Uh, they need it by December 1st. Uh, um, and like, okay, so then you got to think about, okay, uh, now I got to make pr- samples. Okay. So I got to make samples that are, you know, not just your own prototype that you actually get made from a, a company like print and play or ad magic or whatever, wherever you get them made. And so then you got to think about that turnaround time. That's where I faltered a little bit because I did not realize how long freaking shipping would take. And I was really peeved off because their m- website kind of advertised one thing uh, implied that it would take a lot less time than it did. Um, but that was probably six weeks. So now, uh, if that was, what did I say? December 1st. So then we're at October 15th that you'd have to have a hundred percent locked and loaded into uploaded to this, um, um, printing company to, for your samples. That's October 15th. And that's, that means your art is a hundred percent done. So then I had to give m- my artist, Matt, a deadline. I gave him a deadline of, uh, I think two weeks before, before that. So there'd be some time for back and forth and everything. So that's end of September. And so that you kind of keep backing it up of when you need all these things. And all of a sudden you realize like, Oh, we only got, a, <laughs> we don't have much time before we have to get things going. Yeah, like just from, from from following your thought process there, that's already I think seven month, seven months before the actual launch. You, you have, have to bake. It's got to be baked. And if I do this again, I'm gonna even put way put it way more in advance, like way way more in advance, because I I don't think I don't think I gave myself enough time when I had these samples to do everything I needed to do properly. Um, I think I should have had uh, more more just more time with the, the full prototype uh, sample. Um, and probably even uh, spent more time making the sample look even better than I did. I, I kind of accepted the limitations of the printer. Uh, they could only make tokens in square shape. I'm like, oh, really? So I just said, I'm like, okay, I guess that's what we're going to go with. And um, I c- you could have spent more time getting custom ones done. Would have cost more? Yes, but I think it would have ended up being better, and I just was trying to speed through at that point. Uh, in the end, now I'm stuck with these samples that – are less than optimal, but fortunately they still did the job. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, with, with all of these things, you know, all the time that you're spending even before you launch, right? Like how do you, how did you kind of manage your time? I would say, since there's so many different marketing things that you clearly were, were involved in, how, how did you kind of weigh, okay, I'm going to do go to this convention versus like, Hey, I'm going to do, do giveaways right now versus this and that and this and that. I guess it's just the fact when you start backdating it and you start realizing what what you need, then, and if you're researching enough in advance, like I know I wanted to have game trays in my, in my game. So I contacted them like last, I don't know, May or something, May or June. I'm like, Hey, I I know I'm going to want game trays. What do we have to do? Uh, It's not launching until next March. They're like, Oh, great. (laughs) Thanks for letting us know early. Uh, But uh, so then they were giving me schedules as far as their schedule and timeline. So I could make sure I got into their production flow. Um, because they're backlogged like crazy too. So it's just all about backtracking. And I, I really do think that that was the biggest benefit of having my weekly show is figuring out what am I going to do? What do I have to do to get to the next thing so that I could have something to talk about? And I was like, made sure I was always on top of things. And um, yeah, of course I have spreadsheets and uh, trackers to make sure I'm doing everything I can do. I don't, I don't know if I knew, I didn't know everything in advance. It's I only knew you know, a few weeks in advance, or I, I knew two things. I knew the end product. I knew what I wanted it to look like. And so that may, allowed me to backtrack and, and work back schedule to, to figure out how do I get everything to look like that in at the final uh, box. And I only knew maybe a week or two in advance of what's happening. So with those two things, you know, try to make sure that I didn't run out of time. Yeah. I, I think like hearing you talk about this makes me really kind of start understanding this, the, how large the scope of the marketing is, not just, you know, towards the end where we're just getting ready for the campaign, like the few weeks before launch. Right. But it's so when you're peeling back all these layers, there's so many months of just hard, dedicated work that you're doing, you know, a year even before you launch. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's, 
it's just crazy how much almost everything is marketing. It's not a side thing. It's like, it's, it's humongous. <laughs> and I'm really, I'm really fortunate right now because I literally, after this call, I have uh, two calls today with different, uh, different groups of students from a local college where uh, I've been chosen as a client that they are going to create a marketing plan for me um, uh, for off the page games and mind management so that uh, we can you know, continue the marketing uh, as this game gets into, you know, final development. I love it. I love it. And, and I really, it really resonated me, with me when you said, you know, everything is marketing because, you know, I, I love it when creators are coming to show what, what new artwork they have, what new mechanics they're trying, what kind of new game player they're doing, you know, all, all these different manufacturing issues because, you know, it's, it's all just kind of getting people into the mindset of the game and the growth and the, and the changes and the evolution of the game. And so when you, when you said everything is marketing, that I, I think that really just kind of hit the nail on the head for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think a, a key thing too is about branding is really understanding your brand and making sure it always feels like your messages are on brand and your, and your images and your themes of your, of your marketing attempts are on brand. And so we were fortunate that we had access to the original artists so that we could make sure at least the, the art was always kind of felt on brand to the game. But then we also were lucky that the theme is uh, about espionage and psychic espionage at that. So we were allowed to have a lot of fun with our messaging and our, we had secret messages in some of our ads and stuff like that. So uh, really trying to lean into the, the branding was a really key thing for us too. Yeah, actually let's, let's talk some more about that. Cause I know that you did some really cool uh, marketing kind of, uh, strategies and tactics during the campaign. Like you were saying the the little secret messages in the ad. Can you talk to me more about that? Yeah. So when we were going to our first event, we obviously we wanted to hand something out like a postcard or something. And then it got me thinking, I'm like, Oh man, it would be cool if we could hand something up, but it had, it had something secret to it. And we brainstormed for it a while. And I finally came up with this idea of like, um, this postcard will ha- it's going to have, and I'm looking at one right now as I'm saying this, uh, has these weird lines on the back of it. And, and I'm trying not to give too much away, but basically if it says right on here, it says agents keep this postcard to unlock in-game bonuses assigned to management. And so basically it's a postcard with a cover art and then information about the Kickstarter on the back that was given away. If you went to any convention, even I mailed these to the ambassadors so they could give them away. Um, and if you hang on to it, this will line up to something in the rule book and give you some extra, not just like a, a, a fun message is actually will really literally give you an in-game bonus, like a benefit. That That's really cool. Well, that's really awesome. <laughs> it's like, so I recalled it like a pre promo card. So it's a promo card, but you don't even know what it is yet, but it's, so you have to kind of decipher it. Once you even, once you get the game, you still won't fully know how to use it until you figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's incredible, and I believe that on your campaign page itself too, you had some some clues or, or something in there. Or yeah, we had a, exactly yeah. So we did two things. We one we were running uh, the game as uh, because it's a one versus many game, so we actually were able to run the game. Um, I would show the board state and say it's your move, and in the comments, please tell us kind of talk to each other about what you'd like to do, and then I'll take a move and update the board. And we went through that and we played to two versions of the game, which was fantastic. Got a lot of people engaged and got them got to show off how the game worked. And then secondly, we had a secret mission, uh, and it was <laughs> I was able to hide. Uh, images um, of the the bad person in the comics called the eraser and, and a speech bubble coming out of the eraser's mouth with uh, some coded letters. And I was able to hide versions of this all over the place on my website, on my YouTube channel. Uh, and then on every single review that was done, uh, the reviewers were nice and they, they would put it in their video. Like I gave them, I would give them an edited video of it, like splicing in and out as if it was like glitch. And they would put that somewhere in their video review uh, and the print printed reviews I would give them and they would hide it somewhere in their printed review. And so then on top of that, even there was three Kickstarter campaigns that were going on at the same time that I knew the, the creators and I asked them if they would hide their codes on their campaign page. And they did. And so there was even other Kickstarter pages they had to go to, to find these codes. Then once they got the codes, they had to figure out, well, how the heck do I decipher this? And the solution to that is if they were to subscribe to my uh, newsletter, you get a uh, decoder card. 
a, de a decipher card so they can actually decode the message. And then once the message is decoded, and they, they created a, uh, people that were really into this created a separate channel on Board Game Geek, uh, a, a forum thread in which they could chat and kind of bandy around ideas, which was super fun for me to watch uh, in real time as they figured out clues. And once they got deciphered the whole thing, they realized what they had to do was um, it said something about uh, tell me wh where my agents are hiding in the training mission on Kickstarter. And so then they had to actually go back and actually contribute to the game that was being played on Kickstarter. And they had to finish it because you couldn't, you wouldn't know where they were hiding until you finished the game. Once the game was finished, they actually had to go into a media kit that was a linked on my campaign page and, and post the three images of where the agents were hiding on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Um, and that was, I had a hundred people had to do that in order to unlock a new sealed package, a really big um, uh, stretch goalie type thing, which uh, the game comes with sealed packages. So you get a whole new sealed package if a hundred people did this and they did. Wow. Like I was smiling so hard when you were talking through all this, cause it's so elaborate and so creative <laughs> and it like engaged so many people throughout yeah. the game. I, I love it. I, I would love to kind of hear like how you guys came up with this or, or what, was the, what was the process to, to brainstorm it, kind of roll it out. Well, so it's, again, it's about the brand. So I'm not going to do a secret treasure hunt for another one. This is just because it's all about spies and uh, it's a deduction game. So it's like, it re I really was thinking like, how do I do this? Some sort of secret hunt. And then it, it was easy to tie in the eraser. And I'm like, well, maybe, uh, anyways, it was, it, I, I'm not really sure how it all came together, but eventually it was like, yeah, maybe I hide stuff all over the place. And that, you know, made me start, fortunately, I thought about it early enough that I could uh, ask the reviewers, hey, when you're doing this, can you also add this image? And every single one of them said yes. So that was great. Because uh, it's fun. That's a fun little kind of kooky thing. And I said, I, every time I did it, even to the Kickstarter campaigns, I said, I think the small benefit is that you'll have more eyeballs on your site. Because as peop uh, one of the rules on the game was you could never post the um, actual words or letters that you find anywhere, but you could post where they're found. So somebody says, oh, you have to go to the, um, what was the Rachel's game that she had? The tin one, the mint, mint, whatever condition or whatever the mint control, whatever the one that was just on. Uh, so she, there would have, be more people going to that Kickstarter campaign and, you know, maybe they turn into baggers. Who knows? But at least it's more eyeballs on your campaign. So that's kind of how I convinced them. Uh, but it's it's all about the branding. So that that's why I did it for this one because uh, it feels like it's part of the spy thing. Next, My next campaign who knows what it'll be. The, the last campaign I did, which was for the fail faster playtesting journal uh, for a bit of context, that journal has some gamification aspects to it in which as you accomplish specific behaviors that will help make you a better game designer, you mark off progress on these little progress bars. And along these progress bars, you earn badges. And when you earn a badge, you flip to the back of the journal and there are these stickers. You get to take that sticker and put it on the cover of your journal to say that, Hey, I've earned this. And you can actually, see your your progress grow visually on the cover of your playtesting journal and so from for that one to stay on brand um all of the stretch goals was done in a very similar way you would progress uh, based on uh how many twitter followers i had or how many people responded to a poll and every time you would get progress up uh, and then we would earn badges and then it was almost like a store. The different stretch goals cost a different number of badges. And so whenever we had enough badges, I would put a poll out saying, okay, do you guys want to spend the badges on this or on this? And then people would vote and would kind of help create and make this journal, whatever the backers thought was <laughs> the best version of the journal. So I didn't even know at the start what the journal was going to look like by the end of it. Wow. I, I love that, that you're really engaging people and bringing them back to the campaign and also having, you know, allowing them a say in what the final product looks like. I think that's huge for campaign runners and a huge, huge tip is uh, two things is one is you want to make sure your comment section is, is going and you can't just hope that people are going to ask questions. You have to keep guiding them there and telling them to do things. So I had, I had the game and my management, I had the game running and they, they could talk uh, in the comments about how the game was going. I had the secret missions of which they could in the comments talk to each other about where they found stuff and how, how it was going. Um, and then the second tip, this is to have polls and polls can be as innocuous as what color should the fifth player marker be? 
but A, it makes people feel engaged, feel like they're part of it, feel like they're helping create it, feel more ownership towards it, which has tons of benefits as far as them wanting to celebrate and, and, and share this information out to others now and when they get the game because they feel like this, I helped make this game, which you generally get that feeling just from Kickstarter anyways because you, you help make, you know, make it exist because you backed it. But now I also help vote on this and this is what won and now I uh, help create it. So we had, we had a few polls and, um, and I tried to make sure they were staggered uh, so that there was almost always a poll going on and always people chattering. And the, the, most, the, the first one was a shape of a meeple uh, for the recruits. And Matt came up with four super weird looking meeples and it was really fun, uh, really different. And so that was fantastic. People got to vote on that. And then the second one was there's this little dry erase board that the, the secret player uh, draws on their, their path as they walk around behind a screen. But on the back of that board is nothing. So I said, okay, what do you want on the back of the board? We could either A, have a duplicate of that board so that, you know, you just have a, it doesn't matter which side you flip it to. Or B, we could have like, take away the um, uh, art and it's just the, the features that pop. And so it's white and that might make it easier for people that have a hard time or see uh, a comic book from Matt, Matt Kent. He'd actually draw like a, a little comic on the back. And that was a super interesting one because it was going back and forth. You could see the comic fans were all like, Oh my God, I want a new comic from Matt Kent. That'd be so cool. And the board gamey people are like, Oh, I want this white one with the features. That sounds like functional and like really interesting. So got really people got uh, chatting about it. And of course the one hazard in, in a poll is that if people don't get, they lose, then sometimes they can get uh, disinterested. So I, fortunately I had a backup plan where the, I could see that the comic was going to win and so uh, when I announced that they won, I came out and said, okay, well, I'm, even though the comic won, we have a plan because people are talking about the functionality of the board. We're going to actually lighten the background on the main board all, uh, as it is so that uh, it will be close to that um, visually, the one that was, people were, was second, second place. And so that seemed to make everybody happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like that to have like, you know, a plan B so that honestly, everybody who is really passionate about the game, you know, really kind of gets what they want too. Yeah, yeah. You don't want people kind of peeved off and go like, well, that's stupid. I, I really wanted that. Now I don't get it. That's not, that's not good. So <laughs> fortunately. We... <laughs> yeah. So, so out of all the things that you were doing, um, clearly a, a ton for the pre-launch and a ton during the campaign too. What did you kind of think was, uh, I guess, the most effective marketing thing for your campaign itself well i mean and you can't plan on it because you don't know what what anyone's going to say but it was that rattle review is the number one thing that helped for sure and i literally uh teared up when i first watched his video i'm like oh my because it's just such a relief of like a it's validation that your game because i had designed the game too so it was send so it was nice validation go yeah okay it is a good game great <laughs> you never know when you're so deep into it it's like is this even good anymore i don't even know <laughs> and but then secondly as a business i'm like oh this is so good because he, he's so influential um that that was that was the key but you can't bank on that so uh you, you know you know you don't know what he's gonna say because a it was even a huge relief that he even accepted the re, the, the game to review because he doesn't review anything that's sent to him he's got a list and he looks he goes send me the rules and he reads he'll he'll pass and i have no people uh that uh, publishers uh personally that have passed on his their games because he's either not interested in that topic or that type of mechanic or game uh or it doesn't play well too so he doesn't want to play, play it so uh, lucky to get reviewed and then lucky to get an amazing review yeah like absolutely and that's an incredible feat to to you and zen for sure for for getting this done um and Jay, I would really like to thank you for really coming on the show today and really sharing to all of us all these insights about your game and about marketing for your game. I know that a lot of people have a lot of new creative ideas, especially from all these you know hidden clues you were um, <laughs> putting everywhere. And I know people are going to get a lot of really cool ideas coming from this. Um, I hope so. Yeah, I want to I want to see some more engaging Kickstarter campaigns and find ways of getting people to be part of your campaign. I've had so many people that um, have said this is one of their favorite campaigns just because it was fun. And I think another small tip uh, for campaign runners is that you have to be involved in the comments. And I literally, literally responded to every single comment that was ever made. Even if it was like, great idea, thanks. Or even if it was a vote, I vote for comic on the back. I'm like, okay, comics, great. Thanks so much for the vote every single comment a it helps inflate your your comment total which i know is kind of you know fake and whatever but it is true that if i go to a campaign and it's in the last 48 hours and there's 57 
comments in the comments. I'm like, oh, this doesn't look like a very active or engaging community and a set of backers and for a game. But if it's got like a thousand, I'm like, oh, what's going on with this campaign? It's jumping. Something's happening. Yeah, I, I think I had um, heard you talk about this too in one of your videos, and I absolutely love that point because it's it's like what you said. It's really growing the community and making sure that people are engaging and talking to each other, making friends, and enjoying each other's company, and just you know, kind of going back and forth. Um, and it increases the confidence because they see that you're listening to them, that you're uh, um, you know interacting with them as a human. As long as you're never being defensive and that's, you could kill it like immediately. If you ever are defensive, you're like, well, that wouldn't work or anything like that. You can't do that. Every single response has to be a great idea. Thank you so much. This is amazing. Uh, you have to find a way to, to listen, show that you're listening, but also if you can steer it the way you have to go. Cause sometimes if an idea would come up and I'm like, there's no way we can do that. I would just say that, like, that's such a cool idea. Maybe we'll save that for afterwards. Cause that would drive the cost up so much, but I love the idea. So then you, you kind of shoot it down like it's not happening. But I'm like, just all I did was praise them for their idea and thanking them for the for contributing. Yeah, that's definitely a great idea and great feedback for a lot of people to sometimes just leave their comment section just to continue and roll by itself. Right. Um, and, and so before we go, though, what, what's next for my management? Um, so I have, as I said, a couple of meetings coming up today with, uh, marketing to try to figure it out. So obviously we're, uh, finishing up the art right now currently and hoping at the beginning of June to send it off to the printers to start getting the, the samples made and, um, then, you know, obviously fulfilling. And then we're going to try to see what we can do after that. So I have, I've got a few p- parties interested from foreign partners to try to see if I can get, um, uh, the number of orders increased, um, to help me with my per unit costs. So that if I can get it up, uh, they increase the cost and then distribution is super challenging because with only one game, no distributor likes to carry, um, a, a, a game by a publisher that only has one game. So you usually need at least three games to be carried by a distributor. So that means it's hard to get into retail. So other, other solutions are going signing up to indie game Alliance, um, so that they can help represent you at conventions, uh, and sell your product at conventions. And that's, that's something I'm looking into because I, or I am part of Indie Game Alliance. So that's something I'm going to for sure be doing because I, I won't have enough money to have booths space for a while. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, it's a tricky position right now to figure out how the quantity of units you want to order. COVID-19 aside, trying to figure out uh, how many extra copies I can have on hand because you're not going to put them in your garage. They're going to have to go to some some sort of fulfillment center that can continue to fulfill for you. And you, you pay a monthly fee for per pallet. So like how much, how, what are your efforts going to be afterwards to continue marketing that game to keep it moving? You know what I mean? It's tricky. Yeah, absolutely. And so if, if people, you know, are who are listening, they want to kind of learn more about your game and, and get a copy themselves. Like where, where should they head to? They can go to offthepagegames.com. There's a link there that'll take them to the late pledge. The late pledge is going to be open throughout the summer. I'm going to try to keep it open as long as possible because I want to try to get through this COVID-19 situation that we're in so that uh, people can get back to their jobs and have income. Uh, so I'm trying to wait as long as possible, especially for the retailers that back the game. There's a retailer pledge, uh, which we, we need the retailers back in <laughs> online and, and working. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Jay, and for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I love talking about my management. This is amazing. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Board Game Marketing Podcast. For daily tips and advice, find us in the Board Game Marketing Group on Facebook. See you next week.